Okay. Welcome to the John and Josh show. We are J and J. We are we're live. We're at the tail end of Sapphire and we're functioning but not at peak capacity. <laughs> yeah, if I croak a little, you're gonna forgive me, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh in the old days, back in the day, it was me and Dick Hirsch crashing a conference room Thursday morning, but we've changed it all around. Had tip to Dick Hirsch wherever you are, but now I'm in my hotel room because it's the quiet place that I can find before Josh gets on a plane. And I got to get Josh's take because Josh, you hit the show floor hard. You hit a lot of interviews and the whole theme of this conversation is what just happened. Can we, <laughs> can we yeah. make sense of Sapphire? Because seriously, like, especially if you weren't here, but even if you were, the, the news guide is like 650 plus pages long. How is anyone supposed to digest all of that? So now you're going to help us. I'm gonna so, give it a try. Yeah, so so I know you have a bunch of different things you were looking into, but what what, what kinds of things are jumping out at you? Well, I, even before we get to the hard list, I mean, the, the, the in-person Sapphire was back. Yeah. It maybe wasn't as big and dynamic and crazy as it used to be. Right. But it felt pretty good. And there was a lot of evidence that people were glad to see each other, that sidebar conversations, ad hoc, meetings were happening, all that good stuff that could only happen in person was taking place and that the value was being recognized by all. And that, that, that's truly awesome uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, some we don't have to necessarily get into right now, but, but it's yeah. nice to be back. It truly is. Yeah. And, and just for our listeners, we started out the week, Josh and I, we, we had a analyst day, like not quite a full day. We had a pretty and that was mostly NDA stuff, but some of that NDA did lift. Some of the stuff did lift, but um, but we did have some off the record conversations. But then we followed that up with two days of vigorous show floor action, and then we also spoke with a bunch of ASA um, cust right. members at the executive exchange and got some really interesting feedback from them. So one of the things that I do at shows before I r completely run out of steam, there's a couple things that I that I try to do, and I thought I might lay those out there, and then you can riff on some of this. One is I like to try to take a look at the gap in between customer priorities and what the vendor's offering. And there's always gonna be some gap, let's face it. Right. Vendors wanna kind of be relevant to the new stuff, and they have a lot of new things to say, and customers may or may not be fully on board. So I wanna understand that gap. And then there's another gap that we always have to close, which is, the difference between what vendors say about products versus what's actually available, what the timeframes are, what the roadmaps are, and what's act when can customers actually get their hands on stuff. That actually is a lot of hustling to try to figure that out, and I'm still trying to figure out some of the stuff based on some of the stuff that was announced when it's going to be available and all that stuff. So that's the other thing, and you know, so I'm kind of working on that. And then the other thing I do is I kind of prioritize what I think are the most important stories because I believe that it's our job to also surface the stories that are underrated that don't get a lot of keynote attention. So to me, folks like like you and me, our job, part, part of it is to come back to a broader audience and say, here's what we think matters, here's what happened, and boil it down a little bit. So nice. let's see what, how we do. Good. So what do you got? Well, you know, so it, it definitely within the theme of the hidden, the hidden story or the partly in the hidden story. I've been really, you know, you know, I've been a big fan of cloud ALM for a while. I think using the cloud, using the, the telemetry and the cloud to really drive a successful implementation, to manage it, to be able to really make it, make it hum in a kind of automated or semi-automated way has always been something I've been a big fan of. What, what I, I did to th this week was very interesting and somewhat fortuitous is that I had a briefing on Cloud ALM to hear some of the updates. And one of the, two of the most important updates are that they're starting to bring the Signavio business process, management pr business process, mining technology into the Cloud ALM uh, family, which means that among the things you can do with, with your lifecycle management is manage that complicated thing you do with process. And you know whether it's a migration uh, from, a, from ECC to S4, whether it's the net new, uh, uh, implementation process 
renewal process is important. So that was really interesting. The other thing they're doing with cloud ALM, which is maybe even more interesting, is that it's now being extended to work with non-SAP systems. So those implementations that critic that are critical for the for a huge chunk of the SAP customer base, which are going to tie S4 to a non-SAP system, that can also be part of cloud ALM. So I had that briefing, very cool. Mark Tier and his team has been doing a great job. Then I went to talk to Garrett Decker and the Signavia folks and heard a lot more about how they do this support for heterogeneity, um, which which is a big theme of mine. And then and then I you know and then I sat down actually with Jan Gill. And by the time I did that, I, I realized that when you pull cloud ALM and this, these new capabilities together with Signavio, you look at its ability to address heterogeneity, you put DataSphere in the mix. DataSphere is, you know, the new data everything <laughs> that SAP want, wants, to, wants to put in the market. Data being data integration, data management, data quality, data governance are, is, is one of the real tripwires in an implementation. It's where things go, go bad and go bad fast and, and ugly. So if you can, if you have a new tool to manage the data side. Oh, and don't forget about BTP. Got to well, throw that in there thank too. Thank you. Well, I'm getting oh, there. Oh, you're getting there. I'm getting okay, there, bro. okay. Don't worry. All right. Okay. And and I know this is becoming very buzzword compliant. Yeah, yeah. This is really you are. I know. I know. I, I'm I, job at I, SAP marketing waiting for Josh. Oh, yeah, but see, they don't even talk about it this way. So I'm kind right. of sort of. You're right. These are some of these are neglected. Well, the, 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 and, the, and the, particularly the the, the 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 confluence in them all. You had BTP and particularly the integration capabilities. And we know integration is a number one priority. Again, everyone lives in a heterogeneous environment. If you put this all together, what you get is the potential. Potential is the word. It's not ready. It's not not you know not ready for prime time. You can really change how an implementation is done for the better. You can take a lot of the risk out. You can put a lot of automation in it. You can manage some of the real again these trip wires, these, these third rails, the data migration, data management process integration, process management, third-party integration, API management. You can put all that stuff into a, a much neater framework and potentially, and you know, let's, let's check back, it's going to be a year probably, but it, within a year, SAP can potentially go to the customers, particularly these fence sitters in the EC wor ECC world and say, hey, we know you're a little scared of this S4 thing because you got a zillion instances and a zillion customizations, but we actually have a, we really changed what implementation and migration can be like. That could be really huge for SAP. Again, it's all in the execution, but I was pretty impressed that that they've got enough, they've got these moving parts organized, and if they can, if they can pull it together, and they, they need to pull it together. They're not even necessarily thinking that organically about it, but if they can do that, they can actually change the game significantly. Right, and that's that's interesting because, like to your point, it's the potential of it, but it's also that the light bulbs have to go off for SAP, seeing like this is going to be a priority for us. If they do, maybe they have something there. I mean, it was it certainly what you just said speaks to our customer session because we talked about with when we heard the pain points from the executive exchange customers, the big things that really jumped out at me were things like pain points around data, data silos, islands of data challenges of integrating data. Um, and then there was this whole S4 thing around, how do I get to S4? I need more help, I need more. So so part of that is a migration technical thing, like to your point, some of it is process and governance and some of it is talent and skills is a huge one. And then as you and I like talk about a lot is partners, like yeah. like, like, like can, can, can customers find the right partners? And maybe the partners they work with historically aren't the best partners for the so-called clean core era, so which is a whole other discussion. But anyway, that's interesting. Right. Because what you're describing kind of hits on a lot of the pain that the customers were talking about in terms of the things they struggle with. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to the partner point, I mean, again, this dream scenario that I've concocted <laughs> on SAP's behalf, and I admit, you know, it's 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 a dream, but it's not not necessarily too far from reality. One of the critical points again in, in, in what we heard from the, the executive exchange and what we hear all the time is integration. You know, SAP is, is, is enjoined by law from actually, uh, you know, owning the integration to a certain extent. I mean, they can't be the one to deliver the customer master that includes Salesforce because that's, that's an IP problem 
we don't want to go there. <clears throat> That's something a partner can do very easily and legally. And that IP, if, if the partner slots into this scenario of this next generation implementation that includes this integration, that, that IP can be a selling point for the partner. That can be gold, literally, for a partner in a world in which SCP partners sometimes have trouble understanding wh wh what the runway is. Where do they have freedom to make, make a living? And this is a place where SCP can encroach. So mm. there's also a sense for, you know, if they do their, if they play the cards right and they do this well, the partners have something to gain and an incentive to be in, in, in the game in a way that, that certainly benefits them and, and customers as well. Right. And that's a big thing with partners is that they need a different business model to participate in more of a BTP and subscription services scenario, which is also about controlling implementation cost ratios. <laughs> In ways yeah. that are very, very different than the on-prem heyday, and you know, I'm, I've encouraged SAP leadership again and again to elevate the partners that are building these new models and give them airtime and visibility. And I still think there's a lot to be done there because I, as much as they drag part customers on stage in a good way, this Sapphire, like I want them to do the same thing with next-gen partners too, right? And not the usual suspects, not exactly. not the ones I'm now. I now consider the you know the big. Part Partners, they're the sort of the feudal landlords right. in the in the old economic model, and and you know, and they need to. We need to kind of do some land reform and land redistribution to make make opportunity for some of these smaller companies to succeed as well. So, can we switch gears and talk about sustainability? Because I I hear a lot of conflicting things around this from the outside. As far as, I mean, I don't think there's really much doubt that SAP has some real conviction around this topic, and they have for a long time, but that also can lead to some cynicism around like, well, Jim Snobby talked about this in his keynote in 2013, you know, and like, you know, how much progress have we really made? And I think what's really interesting is to ask ourselves, like, can, can SAP deliver on what they're talking about? And what exactly are they trying to do <laughs> as far as you can yeah. tell? Well, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, when you, you know, the, the 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 whole sustainability world, which is governed or encumbered by regulation and law, increasingly so, and increasingly complex regulation and law, is really again a data problem, right? In order to be compliant in the regulatory environment of the United States, of Europe, of anywhere in the world, at the end of the day, you got to prove it. And the thing they were talking about is you know is is proving it with 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 real data, not just aggregated data, not just estimated data, but getting getting the real numbers out there. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna not pass judgment on that. I'm not sure that's I mean that's relevant, but what's to me more important is that SAP has been positioning itself to do this. They have a lot of cred as a European company that they've been sincere. It's not just greenwashing. It's not just press release material. And, you know, in this, this issue of how do you maintain your compliance and in increasingly strict sustainable sustainability regime is going to fall down, fall into the data category, the analysis of that data. And S4 HANA and, and the, and the SAP, you know, ecosystem is really, really keyed up to do that. So, so I think there's, I think, you know, I think, yes, Jim Snobby was talking about it. 10 years ago, uh, we were doing a lot of talking 10 years ago. Um, now, mm -hmm. you know, reality has really smacked us in the kisser in the last couple of years, needless to say. And, we, and, and the global economy has realized it has to get its act together. So the moment has come for this in terms of just standard businesses have to, you know, going to have to be compliant. I, I think there's a lot to be said there. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting too, just trying to understand the scope of some of the announcements because there is a lot going on because they're um, integrating some of these features into um, the business network, um, but then they're also, they have a product called SAP Sustainability Footprint Management, which they're continuing to beef up as part of this, which is to do with calculating your carbon f footprint. Right. Um, then they're talking about the green ledger now. Right which I think alludes to what you're talking about. So part of it is trying to make sense of all this is what I, that hustle that I talk about after vendors announce things and then you try to figure out which customers have access to what stuff and how does it work. Right. You know, whereas the green ledger is still a little bit aspirational functionality to an extent. And 
one interesting thing when I asked about at the press conference, I asked um, Jurgen, Christian, and um, Thomas about was the fact that, you know, folks on older releases, they, they're going to miss out on some of this stuff. Like some of it, I think they do have access to, because I think looking at SAP sustainability footprint management, I don't see something that tied to a, a particular f version of SAP here. I could be wrong, but, um, but Green Ledger is definitely tied specifically to rise and grow. So, which well, is- Well, and S4. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but they really are emphasizing rise and grow as part of like this. And so they have to figure out exactly how that works in the future. But the point is, you're going to have to be on the latest stuff to get access to it, which, yep. is, which is interesting. But look, I mean, vendors can't, you know, they can't make everything accessible to older customers, which is just part of the game. But I just think it's interesting as far as like the idea being that having much more granular visibility. So sustainability compliance is important, but now it's really more about like this becomes part of your day-to-day -day business to be able to see on a granular level how much energy did this plant consume, how much gas did this truck consume. Can you know this this vendor only wants electric delivery and they're willing to pay for it. They don't want, right. you know, like and and that's a whole different like level. And I think SAP is basically saying like we're betting on this, you know, like we're betting that the future of enterprise applications is going to have this integrated into how we do things. And, and it will be interesting to see if that comes true, because I think customers care about this, but to varying degrees. I, I think in some ways SAP seems out in front of its customers on this topic, but maybe that's not bad. Like maybe that's interesting. I, so. I, th I think, yeah, I mean, the regulations are out in front of the the economy as well. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's there's a lot we have to do to catch up. There's a lot of dead pending deadlines as opposed right. to immediate deadlines. So it's good to be doing this now. Um, and I think I think in the long run, what I see is SAP, you know, who which has legitimately taken this position for a while, you know, ten years or more, is it, going to be positioned for the next big thing happening in this world, which is going to be carbon removal. And the carbon removal economy promises to be enormous, an enormous mm. expenditure of capital, an enormous, ironically, expenditure of energy uh, to, to remove the carbon. There's a ton of new startups in that world. And and as well as, you know, the established uh, energy production companies of today are going to be the carbon removal companies of tomorrow, at least they, they'd they like to see that. So having an, having a leg up on that whole sort of next generation energy economy that that's coming down the pike very, very fast, I think is plays well, you know, to SAP's strengths uh, as an ERP leader, as a company that's been doing this for a while. I, I think it's pretty exciting. I think they they certainly have been out in front of this and, and you know, if they can, if they, again, proof is always in the pudding, if they can keep this up, um, it's. I think they're going to be a good good position when these regulations come due and when these new carbon removal uh, technologies really become real. It's interesting just to even look like I'm on the sustainability footprint management site from earlier today, and you know, language like transactional carbon accounting software, like that's very different than the kind of compliance reporting stuff that we used to talk about, which was like, oh, every year we put out our annual report. I think this is way more interesting, like way more interesting. And they talk about act quickly to decarbonize your business and show progress through granular. There's that word again, yeah. granular yeah. transparency, because this is where it all happens, right? The details of sustainability are everything. Well, yeah, you we know. can't fake it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we've been, we, we were living on borrowed time for a while and now, you know, the check has come due and, and we got it. We got to do something about it fast. Yeah. And, and I, and I know other vendors that are not taking that tack. And specifically, I can think of one of SAP's competitors that I know is is kind of like backing off of this. And you see some of this on Twitter during the keynote where some people are saying SAP is like overemphasizing this versus what customers care about. So it's, it's interesting. And I actually don't mind to see SAP taking a bold stance on this because I'm someone who's biased towards that we have to have this conversation and then it goes beyond business. So I kind of take that stance, yeah. but, um, but it is interesting because it's, you think about what truly differentiates a vendor. And I would argue this is one of the things that, that kind of differentiates SAP and maybe it will more once this gets even more productized and that will be interesting. 
Because a lot of times vendors think they're differentiated when they're not. Like, for example, I don't think SAP's AI strategy is differentiated. And I'm sure when they hear this, they'll cry and scream. But I don't think it is because I'm listening to these all, all spring long. And nothing jumped out at me in the AI strategy that made me think, wow, you're really going about this differently or whatever. Um, frankly, I haven't heard from a single vendor except one that I can think of where I th think that. But in sustainability, I can say, yeah, I didn't hear that from any other vendor this year. Right. So yeah, I agree. And and you know, I, I share your your interest and concern. And um, I, you know, for the sake of our plant and our children, I I hope someone gets this right really soon because we we really going to need this uh, sooner rather than later. So we have two divergent directions of things that you are really um, like want to talk about in our time here. One is business network, and one is uh, the pride session, and some of that's themes that we were looking at through some of our friends that were on those panels. Which one do you want to talk about? Next? Let's start with business network and close with the, the okay. good stuff. Um, <laughs> Cause I, I yeah. I'm, I'm really, cool. I'm really, you know, the pride, the pride keynote was exciting, but the, so you've been an network. early advocate of, you were on the, the train early with SAP business networks back when I was kind of just recoiling from what I didn't like around the branding around it. Right. Um, you know, and and thankfully SAP has started to improve its messaging considerably along those lines. But I started paying a little bit of attention to your writing because you were early on kind of scratching under the surface of that and saying, okay, that might be cheesy, but there's actually something interesting going on. And potentially another area where SAP can excel versus its, its competitors. So do you want to just maybe share a little bit with listeners kind of why you think this matters and, and why you think SAP is like doing something interesting here? Well, I, it matters fundamentally simply because we live in an interconnected, interdependent global economy. And, you know, it's the butterfly effect times a thousand, these perturbations across the globe. You know, war, pestilence. You know, I mean, it's it's the it's the it's the plagues. It's the horsemen of the apocalypse. Whatever metaphor, it's coming at us, and and we need to you know we need to do a, really re-engineer how business is done in order to in order to obtain the kind of resiliency and the you know the kind of the the, the kind of uh, adaptability that that frankly the economy needs. So. A network theoretically is the best way to do this. It allows you to, you know, it allows you to interact one to many, many to many in, in different configurations and leverage the economies of scale. Uh, sustainability is a perfect example. I want, I'm a small supplier. I want to be sustain, I want to be certified as a mm -hmm. sustainable supply in multiple supply chains. I, I sell parts to automotive. I sell parts to aerospace and defense. I sell parts to, to you know, to, to Three, three or four different markets. I want to be able to comply once, and and have that and have that certification work. And the business network is a great place to do that. The visibility and transparency in the business network could allow me to meet whatever requirements are, and then publish to anybody. Hey, you can look at my certifications. I'm good. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm good to do business with. Um, that that's a very minimal level, a really really good effect. So what was exciting this year in Sapphire is sap has been building this. It's been fits and starts. They've you know we, we you and I have talked a lot about the, some of the problems with the Ariba user experience as as one of the onboarding experiences. But this was the first time uh, we both sat down with real customers who were talking that talk and mm -hmm. walking that walk. Baby steps sometimes, but they're really. Doing it, I sat down with just with Occidental Petroleum. I think you did too. And I said, "Why is this a business network? Why is this not just a Reba?" Mm. He said, "It says it's 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 a collaborative experience. We're getting we're both we and our suppliers are getting mutual benefit from it, and we and we see the mutual benefit, and we're interacting to our mutual benefit. <clears throat> it's a relationship. It's not just a." Dictat. That's not the word he used. I, that's mm -hmm. what I use. It's it, we're not forcing them to do something. They're doing it because they see value, and we see value, and, and it works. And you know, and, the, and Muhammad Alam shared with me uh, some numbers I can't disclose for some of his customers. Really, kind of mind-boggling results in terms of some key metrics in the in this complex supply chain world. So I, this is the first Safari where I've actually seen seen the business network in action. It's I find that exciting, personally. Yeah, and 
I think it's interesting to kind of look at how it how it evolves from here, and I think there's still some things SAP needs to to conquer. Um, like the three things that I'm really looking for that I think are important are the ease of onboarding, um, the um, what I call discoverability of being able to find each other easily. And I think they're making good progress there. And then, um, and then intelligent matching, which is the next piece, which is can quote unquote AI or whatever the hell you want to call it, can machines help us to put us together, right? right? <clears throat> can, can, can they spot opportunities based on certain capacities or certain whatever specializations that maybe we didn't even know about. Because we st we get some of those from time to time as Ariba vendors, you and I. Um, mm. But okay. but it's kind of more of a shot in the dark vibe. It's a nice sentiment to try to match me up, but it's not, quote unquote, it's very intelligent yet. And so maybe yeah. there's some, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens as they continue to refine the onboarding. There's still work to be done there depending on, there's, a, there's several different, types of networks and I think some of them are further along with that but I think that'll be interesting to see but but you've kind of persuaded me a little bit because I'm starting to understand it from the perspective of like s just supply chain volatility and just and just how powerful it is to to really understand like and have visibility into all of that and the difference that it makes right. so you know I'll add one other imperative that they that they need to keep working on which is part of the supplier uh, onboarding is 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 making a strong case for intrinsic supplier value. And, and that, you know, they just can't, it just can't be show up to do business as usual, um, though that, that's maybe good enough, but that's, that's, the, that's the stick, not, there's no carrot there in, per se. And what, what I'm, I'm excited about and looking for more and more is how is, you know, where are, the, where, are the, where are the places where the business network makes suppliers lives explicitly better where they've got new value, new things they can do. I mean, trade and trade finance is one of them, though. None of the customers I spoke to are really actively doing that. Someday that may be a really good thing. Absolutely, you know, the the you know the, the ability for the supplier to to get flexible payment terms, to use the network for early payment. Those are some of the things, but there's got to be a lot of that. It's got to be very solid because that because for this to succeed, you need millions and that's actually the number i mean it's it's extraordinary number of suppliers in different networks all over the world you want them you want small medium large to to show up happily show up because they know there's something in it for them and not just because they're required to do it right i want to take a slight detour before we get to the pride i want to ask you about one of your favorite topics customer success <laughs> SAP obviously talks about that a lot, as do most vendors. Mm -hmm. What is your take on how do you think that SAP customers should think about this topic? Not how SAP talks about it. How do you think SAP customers should think about it? Uh, wow, it's just throw me a softball, yeah. there, brother. Thanks. Yeah, uh, see if you can answer that without getting us in like serious, serious trouble. Serious trouble. Well, you know, I, I think I think the problem. I mean, customers need to own the success, and I think, and, and I mean that very seriously. A lot of times, customers sort of, frankly, think that they, you know, they, they pick the right vendor, they pick the right product, they they believe the hype, they say, "Give it to me," you know, "Here's my money," and I'm gonna just let let you let you run the show and let me, you know, let me know when you're done. That that model's broken. Um, so to a certain extent, customer success is cus the customer's responsibility as much as it is mm. anyone else's. You've got to hold these vendors accountable. You've got you to you make sure that they don't, you know, they, they're doing their job. And that includes, the, um, that, inclu you know, that includes the partners as well. So I think, I think well, I'm going to start with, and I'm not trying to punt here, but I want to make sure that mm. I make a statement here that you've got, to be, you've got to be involved in your own success. I think I think the 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 other thing that the customer really has, and that that means you have to really be be aware of what it is you're really trying to accomplish. Um, but I also think that you know some of that, for instance, is I, I want customers to really walk away from the technical upgrade. <clears throat> I mm -hmm. think that's you know that's not just you know that's a sale a big sales selling point that the SAP loves to talk about for their own for their own sake, but. The truth is you really don't want to do that. You really want to look at the complexity of an upgrade, particularly if you're going from ECC to S4, as an opportunity to do, do real transformation. 
Um, but I, I think at the end of the day, customer success is going to be very, very individual. So you, you're, you're going to, and we, we talked about this at the executive exchange a little. Like, how do I, you know, what, what should I be doing first is, is always a big question. And I think mm. part, of the, part of the idea of customer success is to say, here's a process that needs fixing. Here's a problem in my business. I'm going to tackle that first. I'm going to set some very clear metrics as to mm. what it is I'm trying to do. How, 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 how much I want to move that needle. I'm going to put that hopefully into the contract. And then I'm going to, and then I'm going to track the partner and, and SAP and myself as to the, are we really meeting those goals and making it very, a very transaction contractual concept so that everyone, everyone knows, knows what part to play and, and everyone hopefully is held to the, to playing their part. I don't know how much of a punt that was or not. No, me. no, that was good. I, you know, I, I like what you said about walk away from the technical upgrade because I think one of the things that concerns me a little bit with SAP right now is perhaps an overemphasis on speed to go live. And I know what they're trying to do there because they, they want customers to find these projects to be manageable in, in scope. I get that. But when I think about this this push to quick go lives, I think about our departed brother, Michael Doan. I knew you were going to say the name. And and, you have to. You have to. You Michael know, was on and, this. And I always think about him at Sapphire because I was some, go back to the 90s with him here and some of the amazing experiences I had with him when he was still building his philosophy, which he eventually put out there in the Green Book, the SAP Green Book, which remains a classic. But but it was it was really all about how do you really extract true value from projects, right? Mm -hmm. And and that was his beat. And you know I think we were all in a way, singing similar t songs, but 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 I think now SAP needs to th to work hard to be careful that that you don't lose that because, like I think like there is a way to have quick. There's a difference between quick wins and a rush to go live. Like right. I think every project needs wins that you can document. That's not the same as a rush to go live. Like one of the um, customers I talked with, Hitachi was cool. You talked with them too. Like I asked them about that because they have a multi-year um, rollout and it's not done. And it's not going to be done for another year and a half to all their regions. And this is S4 and business network stuff. So this is not what SAP wants to brag about on stage right now. Right. But this is the pace that they need as a global organization. However, they can already speak to wins around transparency and visibility of the areas that they've opened up and, and that it's making a difference to their suppliers, right. their suppliers like it, and they can point to that. So I think there's a big difference there, and I hope SAP keeps that in mind. Well, well you know you know me. Uh, you, you, you just triggered my, my auto, autonomic response, which is that SAP has to differentiate between its sales success and its customer success. Right. And I, I'm, a little, I'm, 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 I'm getting a little tired of talking about a customer who's a rise customer as though that rise was intrinsic to the customer's success. It's not. Rise is intrinsic to SAP's success. It's something they used to report to Wall Street. They need to do that. They're a publicly traded company. The stock price does matter. But I, I really wish SAP would also include both as they report to Wall Street, but also in the in the packaging of rise itself, some a real dedication to customer success metrics. And to really p report out to the to the to the market and to the public and to their own customer base, what you know how what how does that translate to success? How many of these you know what what happens when you do a rise contract and how does that become a successful contract? They can do it. It's there. They, mm -hmm. they just have to sort of they have to balance that temptation to make everything relevant for for Wall Street from. <laughs> From the temptation to you know do good for the customers and help the customers understand what their own success metrics should be. Yeah, exactly. And you could have a very successful SAP project without you know being involved with Rise in any way or or not. And and Rise SAP has done a good job of putting Rise customers in front of me. And some of them have great stories, but it's you know I it, it's interesting because. Like, I think SAP's leadership often understands this when you talk with them, but w on the ground, it's different with the field sales reps and their incentives. And to your point, there there's earnings things that go on there that are targets, and so SAP has to own that too. Right. And before our ASUG thing, I was thinking about this because I was like, I'm about to talk with a bunch of customers, and I don't want to talk about rise and grow. <laughs> like, if they want to ask me about it, I'll tell them what I think. Right. So I thought, well, 
what would I say to them? And, and I put together some notes and I'll just give you a really short version now, but I started out with study SAP's roadmaps and strategy, in particular their AI strategy, because that's really big right now, and develop a checklist around AI and how to evaluate that from vendors, including risk management, data privacy, all that stuff, bias. Um, and then, but then my, my next one is take a step back, like, and understand your company's broader inner situation and role. So, so in other words, don't go straight into buying some SAP stuff. Right. Like, understand that stuff, but then let's pull back a little bit. And, and it was all about things like defining your transformation strategy, uh, you know, what the role of ERP is in that context, how you're going to compete, talent, tech, process, and then things about building your network of experts inside and outside of SAP. Somewhere in that context, you can have a RISE discussion. Right. But, but, but it's not your only discussion. And then the next part before you go anywhere is – Establish clear priorities and how you're going to measure success. And don't let any vendor define what customer success looks like. And I think you're onto something really profound there because customer success started as a SaaS-driven conversation by SaaS vendors. And what you're saying is let's appropriate that conversation and have customers define and, and challenge the vendor to agree upon how we're going to measure this and what our true priorities are. But really, when you think about it, it's a win-win because if you can achieve that, now you have some really fantastic stories you can tell that the customer will also be glad to tell because you're on the same page. Right. You know, it's, so, it's, <clears throat> you know I, I was just saying this earlier today is one of my favorite mantras. A lot of the conflict in the world can be solved by just setting expectations right. and then, then matching them. Yep, tracking them, honoring them, and if you can do both of those things, you, you can really you can really solve a lot of problems. If 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 the customer knows what they're going to get, if there's an expectation, if everyone works hard to get there, and they get there, even if they don't hit it on the mark, if they if 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 the general concept has been honored, you know, honorably, then then it's it's a it's a win. It's a win win win. It's great. Then I talk about choosing the right excellent external partners, including casting a wide net, including the ones you don't always run into on the show floor, um, and tie that into your own internal skill building and centers of excellence to make sure you're getting the, the transfer of knowledge there. And then I, th I thought you might enjoy this. Make sure you have a kind of relationship with SAP that adds up to a win-win for both parties. Let SAP know that if you succeed, you'll be a vocal customer advocate. But put SAP on notice if you run into problems and they don't respond ef effectively, they'll be hearing about that too, <laughs> either through ASUG, uh, influence channels, your own account reps, or even publicly that will get their attention. Yeah, the J and J hotline is also. Yeah, open, yeah, they'll right. you know like <clears throat> let us know. Like that's part of our job is to help amplify those concerns, and I think that's that's healthy for vendors to know that either way you're going to hear about it. So let's make make up good let's, stories. Let's, let's talk yeah. about the good stories and not the bad ones. Hallelujah! Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's 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 a, you know, it should be the, it should be the reflex of the industry. It's I mean, there is a there's this Wall Street problem, for particularly the publicly traded companies. It's hard. I legitimately say they they're being held. You know, SAP was always being held to an impossible standard: grow like a cloud company, be profitable like an on-premise company. Somehow, under the McDermott regime, in particular, they pulled that off quarter after quarter. It's amazing. Um, there was a lot of corners cut on the success side of that to do that um and i think that i think we should move beyond that era now all right talk about pride wow that was pretty uh, sorry for the abrupt shift yeah no no let's do it because um what i really love about sap is they do walk the walk when it comes to their people and their relationship to people and it's 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 not it's not pro forma it's sincere um and so, you know, we, um, well, with, there's a lot to, not to unpack there, but I mean, fundamentally, you know, we got to, sh we got the opportunity to sit, sit and watch the first Pride keynote uh, that I think SAP has ever done in, at, a, at a Sapphire. Um, board members, Julia White led that um, admirably and, and credibly. Uh, there were three great panelists. Um, and... And it, it, it really, it was a profound statement and profound moment because here we are in Florida. And Florida has, the, we have to say it, is, is not necessarily a friendly place right now for yeah. the LBGTQ community, for the non-binary community. Um, uh, and, and, you know, this, this is wrong on so many levels. 
And I think it's it's both necessary and courageous for SAP to step up and say, "Hey, you know, we're, we're, we we need to support our people. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna do that in the face of this very scary moment um, in the political landscape, and we're gonna do it by 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 just being open and honest. And here's who we are. I, I really love that. And I think you know, I don't know you want to tell the, the the particular story of who invited us and and how that happened. I think that's also very very sweet. Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, I assume that that they'd be good with describing it because it happened. But you know, Ritu Bhargavar, who you and I know well, is the head of CX at SAP. This was her first time speaking in a Pride panel setting. All the panelists had great stories, right? And you know, and it was just it was cool. It was cool to to be a part of that. I was really really happy that so many analysts showed up and people that that. That, she, that we've worked with in that capacity. And just, I think we all felt like we just wanted to support something that felt courageous to me. Right. You know, to me, when people can like live true to themselves and openly, that's the world that I want to live in. And so I want to, yeah. I want to, yeah. I want to support that, like however it happens. And it, it was just really cool because when you go to a panel like that, it almost feels better like you feel better it's hard to describe it but like for the first time the whole show i kind of just felt like in like okay there's room for everyone here this feels good to be here like it felt different it was like when people speak their truths like that it changes for everyone that's the thing that baffles me about why we fight over this stuff because if you make things better for some people, you kind of make it better for all people. Everyone feels like now I can open up. And after the panel, I actually opened up about something that was pretty personal to me. Right. And it just it just felt natural in that context to do that. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, and I, I want to tip the hat to to, to Julia White because um, it was you know afterwards I was just sort of talking to her and I said you know by the way I, I thought it was really interesting. I noticed that this you know that the Orange County Convention Center has gender neutral bathrooms and and I didn't realize that was going to happen. She goes, Well, we we told them they needed to do that. I'm like, oh, you did this? And she said, Absolutely. This is what you know, and, and I said, Well, it's interesting because as we all know, guess what didn't happen? She said, Yeah, the world didn't come to an end, did it? No, we can mm. we can be inclusive, we can be, we we can we can transcend this 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 messy, ugly, hate-filled dialogue at, that's happening at the at the national level, and bring it down to the personal level, where we are just people, all at the same conference, all we all gotta go to the bathroom, <laughs> we all gotta live our lives, and and I really love the fact that regardless of the, the the maelstrom, and it's truly a maelstrom that's happening out in the you know in the daily news, SAP at a personal level is committed to. To being inclusive, to being protective, to being supportive of people, whoever they are, and um, you can be cynical and say, "Yeah, that's because you know productivity. We get more out of people mm. when they're happy." Duh. Let's, but but it's not cynical. It's not. It's sincere. They really mean it. And I mm. I was really touched by that. I'll just add a little nuance. Also, I happen to notice the first day there's the the big the main thoroughfares on the show floor were, were cement were bare cement. There was no. Carpet and I sort of joked to one of the analyst relations folks. I said, "Wow, too cheap to put carpet down." She said, "No, actually, last year we had feedback from several people in wheelchairs that they were burning out their batteries running over carpet because those mm. those 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 little wheelchairs, particularly those tiny little wheels, really can't navigate carpet well. So we just pulled the carpet out and we're going to let these thoroughfares be cement. And we just did that. And it didn't matter how many wheelchairs there were or not. It was a statement that we are going to just." Okay, we sacrificed some aesthetic. There wasn't plush carpet. We had to walk on, you know, sort of stained polished cement. But I, I like the fact that, that that was easy for them to do, and it was easy mm -hmm. for it to ha to have an impact, even if it's only for a few individuals. It, it makes a difference. Absolutely, and I think it's it's. I've always said that S SAP one of their biggest strengths is that they they represent more of a global and kind of inclusive. Uh, environment and and I think you know it seems kind of silly that that would be like heroic but it starts to feel a little heroic in this context and it's yeah. too bad that it starts to feel that way in some ways but that's kind of where we're at and I remember thinking during the panel like 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 that that just to me this is just about decency it's not 
I don't, I don't see why we have to turn this into heroism, but it starts to feel too political and too high stakes. But it's like, well, if being, if being decent to other people is high stakes, then that's so be it. And, you know, and so then it has to be that way. And so now we have to have these conversations. And so for someone listening to this podcast thinking like, well, I kind of wish they hadn't gone there. I guess what I would say to you is like, I kind of wish the world hadn't gone there. Like, I kind of wish we hadn't gotten to this point, but we have. And so we have to learn how to have these conversations because there's a lot at stake. Yeah. So. And it's the dignity of the people we love, the people in our families, the people we work with every day. They have the right. We all have the right to live our lives. And and I just, I just, I'm so, I grew up in that, with that mindset. I try to live it myself and I want to help other people live it as well. So I was really happy to be there. Cool. Well, I hope some listeners out there got a little bit of sense of connection to maybe you and I and, I and the and the event through that because it, it definitely was like emotional. There were some tears. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, was, and, there was a lot of smiles. Yeah, but and there was joy. some learning. Yeah, and learning too. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I think you know the speaker from the um, the Pulse organization talked about allyship and, and advocacy. It was. I'm still digesting his words. It was there was a lot of wisdom there. It was pretty profound. Actually. Yeah, and I thought there was also some really interesting things around like this notion of that we have these different intersecting identities, and that like the, there are moments where all of us can feel included or excluded in various different ways based on the complexities of 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 how we identify and what we look like, and and that there's there's so much work to do there, but there's also real opportunity, and I. I give SAP a lot of credit for having open conversations about that, and I know they're not the only vendor doing it, but but it's it's good to see it. It's and, great, yeah. And ho- we're going to probably continue along those lines because it, it does get to the heart of everything too in terms of talent as well because I think that we have a real opportunity to extend the boundaries of corporations to all kinds of different talent we don't have. So let's do that and let's have this conversation. So hopefully we will. Yeah, we will. We will. Okay, cool. All right. Well, I think that's a wrap. You got to get on a plane. Thanks all for joining us. And thanks. Hope you enjoy the old school podcast. Got new equipment though. So hopefully, I think it's going to sound pretty yeah, good. good. So. Well, and th- thanks, John, a lot for, yeah, yeah. for doing this. It's always great to, yeah. to, to catch up and to, to do the summary. It, it yeah. helps me think about it. I don't think we made sense of everything, but I feel like <laughs> I understand what happened just a little bit better. So that's good enough. Yeah. All, right. all right. Bye for now. Later.